Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming, Elden Ring and a new Things You Didn't Know episode. We're back strong today with some theories from the community to do with the origins of the lands between before it was shattered, the origins of Melina, another useful in-game tip to do with specific enemies or even crafting. So welcome back, let's begin today's episode. Our first thing takes place not exactly here in this horrible swamp, but very near here. As you may realize then, this one's actually to do with those stone clusters, those special strange stone worm enemies that watch over prisons usually. They come in two types, which are actually both on screen right now. There's the single standing type right there that you can fight more actively, and then the pile there just to the left, which works as a sort of explosive mine, a trap of sorts. You can actually see if I zoom in, the eye that is shut uh, on the main one, on the lead one. And this comes from Clay Clark 577 in the comments. The ones that sit in the piles like this and explode when you get close, actually only trigger when you're standing in front of that singular eye, the one that's closed there. As soon as you stand in front of it, the eye opens and then it begins to explode. So if you were to approach them from behind or pass behind them without actually going in their line of sight, you should be okay. And what you can do to further improve that is use some of the uh, obscure abilities. There's the Ash of War that can make you invisible. We have Unseen Form, which is more of a sorcery. And there's the Incantation Darkness, which puts a cloud down. But the idea is this reduces the distance at which enemies can see you. Now, there is still a distance where it will activate, but I can get much, much, much closer before the eye opens and then blows up. So if you know you're going for an area where you're going to be dealing with lots of these, try to intentionally avoid going in front of them like so, or using one of the many invisible abilities to greatly reduce the range at which they're going to detect you and you won't have to deal with them. Although, of course, you can just absolutely sprint past them because there is a minor delay. But it is good to know that you can do this if it's in your current toolkit, in your build, it's available. It's a cool detail I didn't actually realize that they're entirely triggered by being close to their front, that single eye. So a cool detail. Thank you to Clay Clark for that one and the Anaz for the further comment about invisibility stuff. Next, we have one from an incredible guy on Twitter, DKGP underscore on Twitter. It would appear this person is capable of a little bit of modding with the files of the game because they've used a very interesting anchor point of various things for a fun little, little gimmick. There in Limgrave is, of course, the carriage that's being dragged by two trolls or giants, and there's a few of those around the game. It is technically possible to alter what that chain is bound to, such as yourself, as this modder has done, causing the chains to be bound to the player and then they can run off with them. So it would seem those are his trolls now. It's interesting to see something like this in play. There are many different anchor systems, sort of these looser mechanics like chains and other environmentals to attach things to one another and give an immersive feeling to certain things like this. But it's very cool to see that being slightly altered and used in fun ways like this. We have one to do with a weird chess piece and incantation. Two things you don't really see that often, but there is actually a connection between them. So I'm talking about the Noble Presence incantation here, which is just funny. It's that explosive shock wave of the black fire that you see the nobles use when dealing with the god skins specifically. With my rather random current setup, the damage I'm doing with each one is about 540. And then we do have the black fire burn to get us a little bit more damage. The full tick of that, is 593. But did you know that if you're wearing the Godskin Noble robe, it will literally empower that one specific incantation for some reason? I guess it's because it's their incantation, the one they use. And so wearing this is actually going to increase the damage by a respectable amount, 20% increase. So even with my random ass build not really suited to that, I am increasing the damage by a significant amount. Look at that, nearly 700 damage per hit on these giants. Incredible. It's not a bad combo of uh, an incantation because it comes out pretty quick. It'd be great if it did some kind of real posture damage on bigger enemies like that. But spamming that for some damage and knowing you can increase the damage of it with this chest piece, certainly useful if you're going to use it. Next, we jump over to Reddit on the official Elden Ring Reddit. This one from a little time back now uh, is from I am the Viking now, a user on that Reddit, who found this very unusual interaction between Melina and Bok and yourself when at a specific grace and a sort of specific step in Bok's storyline. Viking highlights that they've played the game for over 700 hours and this is their first time actually hearing this unique interaction. So let's take a look at the clip. Here we have Bok who is speaking with you at that certain point, just offering to alter your 
close at this certain step. His storyline is quite a sad one, as we know. He desperately wants to be beautiful. And you can follow that storyline and turn him into a human, and it doesn't end exactly well. Melina actually comments on this though. If you are to summon and speak to her at the Grace while Bok is right there after that specific step, she'll say this. Your seamster, Bok. I see him crying from time to time. I think he misses his mother. He wants someone to tell him he's beautiful. Does being born of a mother mean one behaves in such a manner? A huge theory is who is Melina, right? I did this whole law video about her and how I thought she could be the Glomite Queen. The leader, the ruler, and potential creator of the Godskins. The original holder of Destined Death before Malekith. That's a whole theory, but there's another aspect of the theory that is maybe she's the daughter of Marika. There's a lot of hints that she's working her way back to the Erd Tree, back to her mother, back to her birthplace. The origins of this character is obviously very interesting and there's a lot of speculation about it. The idea that she says, is that what it is to be born from a mother? Well, to me, that suggests that she has no mother and that she has not been born in that way. So how has she come to be? It makes me lean more on the Glomide Queen theory more than ever. But very interesting dialogue there. And again, one that I have also never seen in all my time playing the game and research this game. So yeah, I found that really interesting. Next up, we have another one back from Reman Chen in the comments. Thank you so much for all of your advice and little tips. You've been a part of the series a few times now. This is a follow-up to a question I posed to you guys. Do you know any particularly good farm spots for specific items, whether that's crafting or otherwise? If it could be useful to someone in their playthrough, then maybe we should include it in this series. And so that's where Reman Chen came back in, all to do with toxic mushrooms. Toxic mushrooms are used in the rot pots and poison pots of the game, and these can be really good because poison's actually better in this patch as well as rot being great. And as a key ingredient in that, having a convenient farm spot for those could be really nice. There's plenty of enemies that are susceptible to poison and rot. Those bigger health pools, this could be nice to have. Here at the Church of the Plague in Kaelid on the east side, right where you would normally find Millicent. And apparently from this very grace, there is three spawns of those specific mushrooms and you'll only have to deal with one enemy. So let's have a look around and see if I can't find those exact mushrooms and then reset. Here we go, round the back I have found the first one. So this is what they look like. They're sort of this glowing white pile of mushrooms on a log. This is around the back right. And yes, there is an enemy that patrols around here that's not too difficult to take down. Here's our second spawn, which is just to the right of the actual church itself. So just back from the other one we were just standing at. Between there, that tree and here. And here's our final spawn, which is actually right where you exit at the very back of the church itself, or right in the main window. So let's reset the grace and see if this is a easy, reliable spawn or they're just a one-time pickup. I'm pretty sure they're an infinite spawn though, so that would make it a great spot. Here's the enemy that is going to be annoying to deal with. Definitely recommend some kind of ranged spell where you can stagger them and kill them like that. That works perfectly. All right, so from the back of the church, we should have one right here. There it is next to the window. Then we just cross over and run straight over here. And there should be one around here. Yep, perfect. Then we just run past the big tree on our left. And it should be just behind these gravestones right here. Yep, perfect. Okay, cool. And on some of those, you can actually get multiple toxic mushrooms in one go. And then that can lead to the crafting of your poison pots or your rot pots, which can be a really useful resource for poison, especially in a build that is not actively using poison. But if you're smart enough to benefit from it, especially in this patch where it's been made stronger, why not, right? There's really no downside. Crafting items is very strong and it's something I ignored overly in my first playthrough. So it's something I want to try to make use of in the DLC, especially against enemies who are going to be weak to different types. I'm hoping in the DLC that more enemies are going to be resistant to bleed and more enemies are going to be weak to things like frost, poison, rot, and so on to give us the variety. Oh, and yeah, less faith than holy resistant enemies, please. Last up for the video then, we have one that is quite interesting. It's a theory to do with the world of the lands between itself and how it's quite a strange shape, this curving kind of large U shape. The idea that Faramazula, which is all the way over here, wasn't 
crumbling in the way that it was. And in fact, it wasn't where it was originally. What if the center, which is sort of a crater filled with water, was never a crater to begin with? What if Faramazula was the core that was ripped out and sent away? What would that look like? And how would that explain certain enemies? Because, for example, in the Kaelid area, those, those horrible, weird dog things, right? We featured one of these guys in the last episode, the one that's wearing a collar, which is quite a unique uh, enemy to look at. But this is what I'm talking about. Not just the weird beast dog things as well. There's also the birds. They appear in a very specific place. Kaelid, all over Kaelid. That makes sense. What makes less sense is that they appear here in the northern point at the mountaintops of the giants. Here are some of the birds. Okay, I guess maybe somehow they flew here. But how were the dogs here? They definitely didn't fly here on weird wings like the birds. They were always here or they found a way to get here. The theory is that as well as Faramazula being in the middle, the world was more connected in a circular shape. For example, if you look at Kaelid here at this point here by the Beastal Sanctum, does that not feel like maybe if it was pushed upwards and the mountaintops of the giants was pulled inwards, there is a connecting point over here? This edited image on Twitter shows exactly what we're talking about, how it's kind of crammed in a little bit and then we have a more cohesive area. The shape of the map itself seems to work with the shape of Kaelid. Various points just kind of intersect, say with Farah Mazula here in the Altus Plateau. I really like this theory and it feels semi-right. Maybe it's not one for one accurate, but I like the idea that this shattering and Farah Mazula that was sent off into the skies, what we're looking at here is more of an accurate portrayal of that. I want to credit who brought this to my attention when I saw it on Twitter, Saint Trina here, an apt name for someone who is doing Elden Ring theories. They created these images that we were looking at, trying to shape the world as if Faramazula wasn't shattered and sent away. Either way, I like the theory, it's really cool. But there you have it, that is today's episode of Things You Didn't Know in Elden Ring. Some very cool theories today. Obviously, it's all speculation, right? You shouldn't take it too seriously. It's just fun to talk about and think about. A lot has changed in the apparent many thousands of years since the Shattering, and it always surprises me just how old the characters involved in the story actually are. The Lands Between, of course, is even older than all that. If you have any cool theories, any tips, anything that you think would work in this series, then let me know in the comments. It honestly survives on you guys, the back and forth and the input that we get in those comments. So as always, a huge thank you for getting involved. But for now, that's today's episode. I've been Hollow, you've been you, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos. Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes. Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice. To reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is, uh, goodbye.